Hi, Rita. I'm really thrilled to talk to you. Thank you so much for, for coming to for being in our class. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. Great. So I'll just shortly introduce Rina, even though you read uh, about her work. So Rina is a veteran um, television journalist. She worked for ABC News, CBC News, I read on Wikipedia that you are also a female bodybuilder. So I'm hoping that there will be some questions about it. <laughs> and in 2020, you created your own company, The Good Trouble Productions, where you produced three podcasts. And I would like to start the discussion first, and then I'll pass it on to my students who will prepare a question for you. And wrecking my brains over why you stopped producing uh, the Rio podcast when it was so massively successful. Oh, thank you so much. No, um, I think what it came down to is we were a small business and we there was only so much bandwidth that we could take. Um, I love that concept and I hope to do something with it in the future. Um, and you, it did really well. Um, but that is just right now we ended up doing this mental health podcast, Ask Lisa, the Psychology of Parenting. And that one with another podcast called Hero, The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, those ended up taking a massive amount of time. So and we're in the middle of COVID. So what ended up happening was it was just a matter of resources. But but I do hope to bring that back at some point. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, I am actually not a female bodybuilder. Um, that's a great um that is a great somebody recently went on my Wikipedia page and added that as a joke. I think, I don't know who it was. <laughs> yeah. So it's a great example of like somebody adding in something that's totally bogus. So I, you reminded me, I need to go back in and have that edited somehow. I can't believe that that person was just able to write it and, you know, yes. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Rina, um, just one more question. I'm really curious because I also put in two podcasts, one mine and one for uh, a client. What changes have you seen in the podcast industry over the past, let's say, three to four years? That's a really great question because I think the industry has changed quite a bit. Um, I really think the biggest change in podcasting is it's no longer audio, it's video. And I feel like if you are not also producing video, um, it's really hard to get discovered. And so having a video element when you're recording the podcast, I think is super important. It's important for shareability. It's important for discoverability. Um, having those clips and being able to post them on social then brings you in a new audience sometimes. So I think three years ago, it was good enough just to have the audio for a podcast. And now because the different platforms were on, you know, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, um, it, it's almost required to have a video component too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you. And now I'll pass it on to my students. So let's start. Uh, if you have to deal uh, with a feeling that uh, there is too much content in, in, the, uh, in the world, and that everything uh, had been already uh, like spoken and uh, told. Uh, and who, uh, I am uh, asking every, every time myself, who am I to uh, make something new and uh, will it be interesting uh, for people? So how, how, what is your like uh, uh, idea how to deal with that? Are you saying how to deal with content creation? Like I have to deal with the uh, feeling that uh, I'm I am not uh, that uh, interesting to give people something new. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think everybody has something interesting because you have perspective and you don't realize the things that influence you and make you think the way you are. Um, I think you've just got to have the courage to go forward and do it. Put yeah. something down, you know. Um, I, I think sometimes it's like with all the different social media things, it's hard to tell what sticks and what won't. So you just kind of got to try and then see how people respond and recalibrate. Sometimes it's not even about the number of likes or looks. 
you know, sometimes it's just about getting content that you feel is good out there and you don't need the validation of having lots of people like it or reshare it. You know, I think we're in such a culture where we're not we're considered not a success if we don't have like 800 likes on one post, you know. Um, so I think if you feel like you've got something to share, uh, it's really important. Um, I remember last summer seeing that one of the top podcasts was a lady during COVID who just read from the Bible. And it cracked me up because this lady from Texas knew nothing about podcasting. She had no media backing, you know, nothing. But she just felt it was interesting and people should share, she should share it. And it grew into this massive podcast of her just reading from the Bible. So you just never know what content you are putting out will resonate with people. So that's why I think it's important to kind of be brave and put it out and not worry about, you know, how many likes you get or if it's popular. Okay, thank you very much for your of answer. Of course. I wanted to ask, what has inspired you to start your own company, even though you were very successful in your field already? Like, what was your main motivation for doing that? Uh, great question. I um, I really felt a little frustrated. You know, in I started my company in June of 2020, and it was end of April, roughly March. Um, yeah, end of April um, when we went into lockdown here in the U.S. And then they allowed us to do our shows for um, CBS from our house. So I just remember plugging in my lights and all of a sudden thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I can't do this another day. It's so boring, so dull. And for 18 months before then, I had been meeting with people because I knew I wanted to start my own production company, but I didn't know how to do it. I never taken a business class, so I didn't know the business side of it. And when you're a journalist, you know, most people don't take any business classes. They don't even know how to create an Excel sheet, you know. Um, so I was really trying to do the legwork before to figure out how can I do this. My problem was being at CBS, I am not allowed to start another company, you know. Um, so I was trying to figure out all how that would all work out. And then in 2020, in May of 2020, they had massive layoffs at CBS to cut costs, and I was one of them. So in a strange way, it felt like an opportunity that um, I had to leave CBS, and finally I could start this company. So it's interesting how life situations work out, um, pushing you in a direction. And I had for 18 months tried to figure out how can I do this, how can I do this, and was sort of forced to do it. And um, I'm really grateful because it's been now, what is it, a little over four years. And, um, you know, a lot of people say with companies, sometimes you really don't know what the company is for the first five years. You're pivoting, you're trying to figure out what your market is. And I think that's really true. I sort of feel like by next summer, um, I feel a sense of confidence about what we've achieved and the team we've brought on. And I do really think we're seeing especially in the U.S., a massive breakdown of media, of traditional journalism places that they can just no longer pay for the salaries for people because the economics don't make sense. Ad sales, which is the major revenue for most television stations, is really, really soft. Cable um, subscriptions, people are just not paying for cable, and that has declined massively. And that used to be um, a great source of revenue for cable sites. So I do believe that we are entering an era where media is being broken down and rethought. And I think a younger generation who doesn't own televisions, but's on their cell phones and on TikTok is really changing the game in how we look at media. Hello. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Or good afternoon, I guess I should say for you guys, right? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm John. Uh, I'm a Catholic priest and I uh, studied media studies uh, and journalism. And uh, I worked uh, with Christian radio station uh, before, and then I decided to study uh, journalism. Uh, so, uh, when you're being uh, interviewed uh, on camera on a, uh, or on a podcast, is there anything uh, you're afraid of? And uh, how do you overcome it? Um, is there anything that I... Uh, uh, you're afraid of. Afraid of, yeah. Um, well, and can I just say, I think it's so cool that you're studying journalism. I think that's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, I um, know 
there's nothing I'm afraid of, but I will tell you one thing for people who are jittery. Beyonce um, has said that before every concert, if she's not a little bit nervous, she feels like something is wrong. Like you always need to have a little bit of nerves and a little bit of anxiety. I think I started at a very early age in high school doing speech and debate and speaking in front of people. And I've always felt very, very comfortable. I have a best friend who's from Hungary and she has mass, she's incredibly smart, but she has massive anxiety over speaking in public. And I just think people are very different. And that fear factor is very real for many people. My suggestion would be to just keep doing it. The more you do it over and over again, pushing yourself, it, it doesn't matter whether it's at a church or it's at a place you volunteer for, finding opportunities to speak is how you get better and kind of overcome that total fear factor. Um, a lot of times I also feel what helps what, if you get nervous easily is to really know your material. So if you're presenting on something, if you're talking about something, um, I think it's important to really know it. And the same goes for interviews. If you're doing interviews, really studying on the background of the person, going over the questions, kind of getting a sense, what is it that I want from the interview? If I had one question, only one question I could ask everyone, what's that one question that I would want? Um, you go in and it's almost like you have a thesis, you know, you kind of have an understanding of what's going to come out of the interview. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's not, you know, a lot of times I found journalists don't know how to pivot. They go in thinking, this is what the story is. This is what the questions are going to be. And they don't listen when they're doing the interview. And I think it's important to be in conversation and to be able to pivot and respond and react. Sometimes people say something and drop things in interviews and you're like, wow, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that. And being able to go back and mine it and, um, you know, get more information on that is also really helpful. But if you do have anxiety or fear, I think being as prepared as you can is super important. Doing this as often as you can and finding ways to speak, I think that really helps in giving you the confidence that you can do it. Thank you. <laughs> of course, my pleasure. <laughs> Bye. Hi. Uh, Hi, Stephanie. I study European studies and journalism, and I really wanted to ask you. I was very impressed when I read your CV because I felt like you've done everything you could. And I wanted to ask you if it was just partly like opportunities coming your way and just a want of trying something new, or if it was also in a sense uh, to prevent yourself from burnout or some like, you know, mental mm. issues. Mm. Um, Stephanie, thank you for that question. And thank you. It, it it never feels like you've done it all. So to hear you say that you look at my resume and you feel I've done it all means a lot to me. Um, I think I was very driven at a very young age. Like I knew when I was five years old that I wanted to be a television journalist. There was a woman here in the US, um, you know, when I was growing up in the 80s, there was really only three channels, ABC, CBS and NBC. And, and there wasn't a lot of other programming. And so every Friday night, Barbara Walters did something called 2020. It was a show called 2020. And she would sit down with celebrities and interview people. And it was just fascinating. Um, and so I think knowing early on, this is what I wanted to do. I was so driven. So as soon as I got to college, I applied for as many internships and worked really, really, really hard um, and just pushed myself. I knew I wanted to be a television um, reporter. And so I just think when you're hungry and you know where you want to go and you're determined, you look for every opportunity, every resource. And now at 45, I have a very different take. You know, that's why, Stephanie, it's so nice of you to say that you look at my resume and you feel like I've done it all. Um, I, I think you make a good point. Like, you know, there was a lot there that I've been able to cover in the two decades of working. Um, but now I just sort of step back and I look at my work very differently. One what's changed is I'm a mother of a 13 year old boy and a 12 year old girl. And I realize my time with them is very limited before they go off to college. Um, so the priority for my family is very big. And I think one of the things indirectly, I didn't realize it as much at the time, I just had a longing to start my own company, but I realized being able to have my own company, I'm able to set my own schedule. So one of the things I do is my kids come home at 2.50 every day. And I'm able to sit with them, have a snack, talk to them. And I don't take calls during that time period. Um, 
you know, I am very um, careful in, in, in where I budget my time. I do something called block scheduling where um, like the shows I'm working on, the projects I'm working on every week, I kind of give it a block of time. Like on Monday mornings from nine to 10, I block out that time. And this is where I'm working on that podcast. And this, so, you know, I have to get creative with my time. And um, I was on a call with a consultant yesterday. Um, he works one of the big consulting firms here. And he said something to me, um, you know, he works for the consulting firm. And he said, he's also trying to do his own entrepreneurial stuff. I said, well, how do you do that? You've got this full-time job and you're entrepreneurial. He goes, well, there's a saying we have nights and weekends. You know, if you want to create your own company, it's nights and weekends. You have to do it outside of your scope of work. And I think that's true. Like if you want to run your own company or be your own boss or have your own own thing, you have to really put in a lot more time and energy and effort and I have to say, you know, it's really taken me four years to feel like, OK, I, I, I feel like we're, we've got some momentum. It's really, really hard initially. And I think that's why many companies and businesses end up failing in the first year, um, whether it's a cupcake um, shop or um, a media organization. Um, it takes a lot of drive and energy and you have to really, really want it. And I will also say in that year or two years, you know, if you start a company and you feel like it's not working and you want to stop, I think there's also value in that because you learn a lot in those two years. Not every company is successful. So um, I, I think it is those experiences, though, in the past two decades of me hustling and doing everything and pushing for everything and um, that's made me a better businesswoman. I don't think that I would be a great businesswoman at 30 as I am 15 years later at 45, because I've had those journalism experiences. I've worked in those newsrooms. I've covered those wars and those elections. So it's given me a great sense of perspective and experience. And I think there is opportunity in everything you do. You know, you might not feel like you're at the place you want to be in life, um, but that journey is so, so important. And I feel like over the course of my career, I was so eager to get to end point. I was so eager to go from producer to reporter. I was eager to go from reporter to anchor. I was eager to go from anchor to businesswoman. And um, sometimes it's that journey that really helps you, um, helps get you through um, where you're meant to be next. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Of course. You should really check out that Wikipedia because according to Wikipedia, you have three children. That is, so, so somebody is like really, messing with my, um, yeah. I, you know, it, it's interesting. The reason why I didn't change it was because like they can see your IP when you change it. And I didn't know if this crazy person was trying to track down my address and then, but, but you're right. I need to, I need to do that immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You now, can you come? Okay. And, yeah. But, um, so another student one. Valeria, right? Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Valeria, and I would like to ask you, so you reported from uh, kind of most dangerous places in the world, mm -hmm. and uh, how do you prepare yourself mentally and emotionally before going into such a risky environment? Yeah, thank you for that question, because what I love about what I'm hearing from you guys is there's an emphasis on mental health and making sure you're in a good space. And can I tell you, when I started 20 years ago, nobody talked about it. Nobody cared. Even if it was very visible, you were in a bad spot. It's like suck it up and go on. So this is such an important question because I feel like if you're not in a good spot, how can you be expected to get good content or get a good interview or be able to function properly? So the fact that we're thinking about this and you're talking about it and it's top of mind, is it makes me so happy. Um, I think part of it, the bill, when I look back now, of me being able to function and operate was I really very badly wanted to be there on the ground. I was upset with the war um, and I wanted to see for myself why the Americans had gone into Iraq. I had questions of why we are fighting this war, why are we still there? And I, I was really moved by getting answers to those questions so I felt comfortable going in. I will also say, um, when I went to Iraq, I was working for Fox News, and um, I um, 
I, I was really lucky because they paid millions and millions of dollars for good security on the ground. And there are a lot of people who come into Iraq um, who are journalists who are freelancing, hoping for an opportunity. And it's so dangerous because you just don't know the risks. When you have a security team, they are plugged in and, um, you know, nothing is 100 percent safe, but you it's better because they actually have intel on what's happening. And and that really, really, um, I have to give them credit for investing all that money in safety and security because it really did make a difference. Um, so I had confidence because I wasn't going, you know, by myself with my backpack and flashlight on my own to these war zones. I had an infrastructure in place of where food was delivered and the bureau was run and um, there was safety and security. So I think having that infrastructure in place made all the difference so that I could focus on my work. And I didn't really have to think much about um, the safety and, and security of my well-being. But it is always a risk when you cover a war. Nothing is 100%. And um, I look at Ukraine and I look at Gaza, you know, um, there are no journalists in Gaza. We have no idea what is really happening in Gaza. We don't. There are no cameras there. And I just do worry that, like, I felt my time in Iraq in 2005 was very dangerous with suicide bombings. I got car bombed four times in 10 minutes at our hotel in one instance. And I thought it was absolutely the height of danger. And I think it's only gotten worse and far more dangerous for journalists. You look at Ukraine, you look at Russia, you look at Gaza. Um these conflicts are not easier to work from, despite us having more technology. I think they're harder to work from because people have gotten smarter in their ability to retaliate. So I think knowing that you want to do it and going to cover a war, um, that makes all the difference because then there's motivation in being there. But I don't advise if you're feeling anxious about it. It doesn't feel like the right thing. I think you have to listen to your gut. Not everybody is meant to cover wars. Not everybody needs to cover wars. But if something doesn't feel right in any sort of interview, whether it's a war, interviewing an executive or somebody on the street, um, you've got to listen to your gut. And I think so often people disregard that and um, paying, being able to hone in and, and pay attention and listen to that uh, feeling, I think, can can really make all the difference. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Of course. Hello, I'm Diana, Hi. an Erasmus student from Romania, and I wanted to ask you, it's, it's easier to look like this, I wanted to ask you how difficult it was for you to like make your voice heard as a, as a woman in the US, as an Indian woman, let's say, and so on, especially mm -hmm. in this domain of journalism. Mm. I think it's frustrating because at times you hope people are listening and then their actions show that they're not or they don't care, you know. Um, I think you just go back to listening to that voice inside of you of pushing you to where you need to go and what you need to do. For me, I really focused on my work and I felt by having good interviews that get noticed, that helps you um, create some... Um, some of us say, because then people realize, okay, she knows what she's doing. She's able to land these big interviews and conduct them. And then they have more confidence in you. And then they listen to you. But I do think you're right. Like in the beginning, when you're first starting off, they don't take you seriously. And um, trying to get them to believe in what you said can be so frustrating, but you just have to sort of persevere and um, keep going. And I think that really helps in making the difference by putting one foot in front of the other. Sometimes it sounds so basic, but I think just continuing on that path and pushing and pushing and pushing and knowing not every time you're going to get the outcome that you want. Um, and I feel now that I'm 45 and in a different place, I have more of a voice, but I think your question is so good because I think if I'm being honest, for the majority of my career, I felt like I didn't really have a voice, that people weren't listening to my opinions or ideas. And a lot of it is because, you know, if you're younger and you have fresher, newer ideas, but they've only done things one way for three decades, I have found it's a lot harder to change. But the good news is, I think, being young and um, being on all these platforms, I think it makes... Um, you guys have done this all your life and you know what it's like to be on social media. And I think that really helps that you have 
that other set of expertise and understanding in a way that somebody who's been in this for three or four decades does not. And I think that's where the future is. It's digital. Um, it's being able to understand that. It's being able to understand audiences online. And um, I just feel like the younger generation, your generation is so far ahead of that. Okay, thank you so much. Of course. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, as you said, you did a correspondent in the Middle East. I'm interested in, uh, in how it shaped you as a person and also how it shaped your career. Why? Mm. Mm. Yes, you know, um, I met my husband who um, I've been married to for two decades. He um, he was also a journalist in the Middle East. Um, I had both of my kids when I was based in Jerusalem. I came back here to deliver them in the U.S. But so I feel like, you know, um, it was an early chapter of my career where I was establishing my family. And I think um, being out there has really shaped um, and being out there when I was young. I don't know. I, I feel personally the things you do in your 20s can have significant impact on the rest of your life. And I feel that way for me at being out there from like 25 to 31, um, being able to experience that really um, has shaped a lot of my thinking on the world and globally and understanding the different structures. And um, so I think that having that opportunity early on and, and being able to be out there really helped in removing my sort of American mindset of looking at a problem one way, being able to see it through a cultural lens, living that cultural lens every day, um, experiencing it, um, you know, it was really hard for me. Um, the day I left Jerusalem, I, you know, I had a one-year-old son and my husband and we were moving back and we were very excited to be back in the U.S. But um, I felt sad because it was a really special chapter of my life and I enjoyed it. Um, and then 20 years later, um, I feel like it's come back in a way because the situation in Gaza and the Middle East, and I'm doing some projects also um, in the Middle East again. And so I feel like that experience and opportunity has come back. Um, I'm able to use my expertise in a different way um, two decades later. So I feel like you know, being exposed to these things in your 20s can have lasting implications that are good, that are really good. Um, but I think there is something about early on in your career, uh, those connections, those contacts, where you're placed, what you start to do can really shape um, the trajectory of your career and, and how you look at life and news. Um, what do you think? Like, do you think like journalists should go on total freelance or they should um, kind of get into a revolution or something like this? Um it's a good question. I, I, um, I, I don't know where we are headed. I just feel, and I hate saying this, but I feel like it is a deterioration of news that's only going to continue as people funding it are pulling out. And, um, as there is not as many people watching television news, you know, it's really people over 60 overwhelmingly are the ones who make up the audience for television news. And, you know, I think television news does really, really well when there's a big moment, like a debate, a presidential election. Um, if there's some big tragic um, tragedy, like a celebrity dies, you know, other than that, day in and day out, we're all on our mobiles, we're getting our information from TikTok, we're on Instagram, you know, um, how our news is delivered has changed. And so I think that's had very real consequences on the industry. Okay, thank you. Of course. Uh, hi, uh, my hi. name is Valentina and I'm studying uh, journalism. Uh, and I wanted to ask you because uh, you have like this great career behind you if there is like still something that you would like to do or that you dream of that you just didn't achieve yet mm. yes i am really passionate about helping women um entrepreneurs and start small businesses i um am realizing when you look at news organizations it's gotten much better but a lot of it is run by men and um, I think women have a different perspective. So I really, really, really enjoy talking to women about how to get their companies up and running, what they can do, how they use social media. Um, 
And, um, you know, one of the podcasts I do is called Hero, The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women. And it's with the Gates Foundation and Foreign Policy Magazine. And what we look at are, are women in Africa and Asia who are told, stay home, milk the cow, don't have a career. Um, how do we help the men around them see that when they're working, um, it's going to help their country's GDP, it's going to help the family, it's not going to take away from the men. Um, and that's been really insightful working on that podcast, because I've really seen what it takes to help these women in remote villages become entrepreneurs and overcome the stigma that, you know, women can't work. So I think that is something I'm really, really passionate about. Um, I am I'm 45, but I really look at projects now with, am I going to enjoy this? Is it fun? Versus like when you're at the first stage of your career, you kind of are building and taking the opportunities as they come. Um, and I'd also say, you know, be open to change, you know, things that you, you might think, okay, this is what I want to do. I, I want to get this job, this particular job. And then something else comes your way. And, um, it, it might not have been what you thought initially you would would do, but it could be a good opportunity and it can take you in a different direction too. So um, at this phase in my career, I'm very open to things that uh, I'm not set in saying, okay, this is it. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm only going to create content. And that I, I think I'm really, really open to seeing um, what other opportunities, how my expertise can be used. And um, I think being open sometimes brings in other opportunities that you might not have considered. Yeah, thank you so much for answering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, since you speak Natalie, right? You can come. I came across your work through the Hero podcast. Yes. I I listened to a few interviews. Good job. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. We are um, next week going to the IMF World Bank to tape the next season. So I think it'll come out um, probably end of November. So watch for that. And what a great client. I mean, for an yes. like the Gates Foundation, it could lead to more projects, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. I think um it's it's really a great opportunity. I'm really grateful. But again, to the point of like be open to things that come your way. I'd never thought about something like this. And they came to me and um and it's been great. It's been really wonderful. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, so my name is Natalie and I study journalism here uh, at Masaryk University. And I just maybe wanted to ask you, uh, what's one piece of advice uh, you wish someone had given you when you were starting your career in uh, the journalism industry, especially for navigating the uh, challenges of the industry? I think this piece of advice, I don't know that I would listen to if someone had given it to me, but I just think being able to find balance, and I think your generation is far more better at this than my generation was, um, being able to find balance that work isn't everything. And it's such an American thing where your work is your identity, your work is everything, you work, 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 work. And um, and yes, it's led to like, you know, it, it's really nice to talk to you guys and hear you say you're impressed with my resume and you feel I've done so much. Um, I just felt like that was my motivating factor. I really wanted to succeed at work and, and my aspirations as a journalist. Um, but I remember when I first became a reporter at Fox News, I went from producer to reporter. And that was a big thing because most people never jump from producer to reporter. And I remember one of their reporters said to me, goes, you know, I'll just give you one piece of advice. I have missed countless weddings, birthdays, baptisms. Um, I've missed so many family and friends events. I cannot tell you what news story it was that I was doing when I missed those events. All I can tell you is I wasn't there for those events. So that has always kind of resonated with me when, when given the opportunity of I'm going to miss this big story uh, to go to this person's wedding. Um, having that perspective always made me feel confident that going to that wedding or whatever vacation or whatever was the right thing to do. And um, I think you are a better journalist if you are balanced, if your mental health is intact and you're not giving into the pressure of, of work. Um, finding out what gives you joy and, and doing that throughout the week. 
Um, I am personally learning how to kind of um, reset my body throughout the day because I feel like we're all under a lot of stress. Um, somebody told me about breathing where like you inhale four times, you hold it for seven and then you exhale eight or, you know, it can be whatever count you want really. But how that can, when you feel overwhelmed and like you just have so much to do. Um, so I'm learning too about ways to take care of myself, even at 45, that um, will allow me to be happier and more balanced. And I think um, knowing that that is important is is really a good thing. And finding finding time in your week to do things that you love that that isn't. I mean, if so much of our day is, you know, getting studying for this test and writing this paper and doing this project. And I think being able to have those moments of joy and and seek them um, daily is really important. Then would you say that you are balanced now? Oh, great question. I, I would I, I would say I'm far more balanced than I was 10 or 20 years ago, for sure. And, and I attribute that to being able to work from home. Um, but I, I do, you know, being able to work from home, I take walks with my dog. It sounds silly, but I think for me, being in nature really helps me clear my mind. Also, I find when I'm on my phone all the time, I'm going from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom. Um, you don't have time to think like you don't have time to sit with your thoughts. And I feel like once you have a digital detox and you're not on your phone and you're just able to just let go of everything, that's when you get great ideas. You know, what stories you should do, where you should go, who you should maybe reach out to and connect with. So um, I'm learning not to feel bad for the down periods when I need to recharge. I'm, I've learned to mm -hmm. value sleep. You know, going to bed early is far more important. I have found that right before I go to bed, I don't know if you guys do this, I'm scrolling on my iPhone for hours and that's keeping me up and I'm not getting, I did this last night. Um, so all night I was very worried I was going to miss the call with you guys because I was going to oversleep. <laughs> um, so having good digital hygiene, you know, I'm, what I want to do is put my phone in another room and charge it. I think I'm going to start to do that because it's really affecting my sleep. But these little things, you know, fueling your body right, getting eight hours of sleep a night, um, drinking water. I'm, I'm really having to reteach that to myself as to why that is so important, you know, for us to be able to um, continue and keep going. Okay, thank you so much. Chris. Have you read the book? Uh, I think it was written by Adam Walker about sleep. No, no, oh, I'm going to have to. Yeah, it's Ed, like Ed the science of sleeping or something. A friend of mine uh -huh. always talks about that book. And basically, you're already doing what you should <laughs> sleep eight hours per day. Oh, I just wrote that down. I'm going to look that up. I, I'm very <laughs> obsessed with learning more about sleep and how we can and wellness. That's really a, a like the second sort of the next sort of phase that I want to dig into deeper because I think more than even the news that wellness really affects us and how we operate. And um, so I'm very interested in that topic. Yeah. And what I, what I sometimes, or what I do is I switch off my phone before I go to sleep. So you can also try that. That's a great idea. You're absolutely right. Prevent you from scrolling. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah. I think I just need to remove it from my room altogether. So yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Anna. I study uh, journalism and uh, social anthropology here in Brno. And I wanted to ask about the work-life balance originally, but I also yeah. would like to know how your working schedule and routine changed during your career change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, never, ever, ever, ever did I think I would be able to work from home because in journalism and television news, you have to be in studio, you have to be around all your other producers. So it was COVID that really forced us to rethink work and being able to do this. And then that was a game changer for me because then I'm not commuting. It's it's about two and a half hours, um, my commute. It's it's an hour on the train each way into New York. And then, you know, walking on the subway um, to get to the other location, it, that takes time too. So um, that's a huge chunk in your day that I now get back and I'm able to do other things like, um, you know, I was telling you about wellness is so important, like being able to make fresh food and cook. Um, uh, so I think being able to set your own schedule by working at home and deciding when you're going to tape things, uh, deciding what meetings you're going to take, who you're going to talk to. It was a massive game changer. But I will say the reverse of that is when you're working for yourself, you've got different stress because you need to lock in those contracts. You need to um, have projects coming in. You need to find people to fund it. So that 
the trade-off, everything has trade-offs, is I don't get a weekly paycheck from somebody every week. I have to go out and seek that and make that happen. And, you know, when a project ends, you could go a couple months without sort of, you know, something coming in. So being able to budget for that and 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 know that. Um, but I, I just, I don't think that I could ever now at 45 go back and working five days a week in an office in New York City anymore. But never say never. You just never know what opportunities could come your way. But um, I really do enjoy um, being able to work from home. Yeah. It's maybe a bit personal, but do you have an office in your home or are you able to yes. work from your kitchen? Yes, this is <laughs> this is my office um, that you're seeing here. I've got multiple cameras um, and multiple lights. And um, but I, yes, sometimes I do like to take meetings from my kitchen. Um, uh, and um, I will tell you, this is like I have a lot of windows around my this office. And so in the winter, it gets cold. And just this week, it turned here in the U.S. was a little bit colder. So I have a little space heater that I turn on. So a lot of times I end up taking meetings from upstairs in the winter because it's just a little bit warmer. Thank you. Of course. And speaking of working from home, do you also do any um, like offline work where you meet people or interview them in person? Yes. I mean, a lot of it, you know, I think it's still, you've got to form contacts, right? And build people's trust. So a lot of that doesn't happen on camera. So uh, I will tell you, um, I am going actually into New York once or twice a week to, to make contacts, meet people, reconnect. I, I found that COVID, everybody was at home and now everybody really wants to connect in person and meet. And that's really, really important. So I do a lot of that as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And these hero interviews, they are mostly by Zoom, right? They're mostly... Via Zoom, like you, you talk to yes, people. Yes, they are. Although we're going to be doing Christine Lagarde and some other um, finance ministers, and that'll all be in person at the IMF World Bank. Hello. Hi. Hi, my name is Yuna. I'm from South Korea. And I, I like to, I like to write about myself, uh, like what, what I like and what I feel something like that. But I think other people who don't know me won't find my story interesting. Mm -hmm. I want to write about myself and I want to write uh, something that people will read and like. So I wonder how I can figure out what people want from me and what good things they can get from me. Oh, I want to ask you, how do you figure out people's need, what people need, what people want when you write and make content? Knowing your audience is very important. You've highlighted something really, really important, knowing what your audience wants, what they're interested in. But I think you've got to have the courage just to go ahead and put out the content and what you want to tell people about yourselves. There's a reason you feel that way. And it's likely because there's other people out there who want to know. So I wouldn't worry about, do people like this? Do they not? Will they find it interesting? Just do it. Do it a couple of times and see where it gets you. You might not get any likes. You might not get any follows. But it might feel good to get that out there and off your chest and put it into the world. And I think that, too, is important. Sometimes we've got to have confidence and faith in our own ability to be able to determine what content content might be interesting. And I know it can be very difficult when it's content about you to put it out there because, you know, like you said, well, people find it interesting. But sometimes I think just having the courage, putting it out there and seeing what sticks. And you can't just put out one thing. I think you've got to do it several times um, to kind of get a sense of how it resonates. And don't be afraid of criticism. If somebody doesn't like it or whatever, you know, there's always going to be somebody who, who has something to say. But sometimes the criticism makes you stronger. It makes you better. And it makes you look at what you're putting out in a different light. And sometimes you just have to rethink um, the angle or how you do it. But I think it's important when you feel like there is a story to tell. Don't worry about validation from the public. Do it and see what happens. Okay, thank you. I got some courage. <laughs> Good. I hope so. I think, you know, there's a reason why you feel that way to do it. Okay. Perfect. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much, Rena. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you for pleasure. being such a fabulous teacher yeah. and for 
um, reaching out on this. It was it was such a pleasure. You guys had such amazing questions and um, you have a, a phenomenal teacher. You are so lucky to have her. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Of Thank course. You. Bye okay. guys. Take bye -bye. care. All right. Bye-bye.